Um, I am Gina Ganskop, Education Director at the Penobscot Marine Museum in Searsport, Maine, and I hope you're excited for tonight's program as we kick off a series of programming all revolving around Henrietta Gary's dress. And more information about upcoming programs is available on our website and on Facebook. Um, but tonight's program is new and exciting. And I, I hope you agree with that. Um, I will start it with sharing what we know about Henrietta Gary, her life at sea and her dress. And then I will turn it over to Annalise Meck who will model a historical reprodu reproduction of an 1880s outfit and discuss the various elements to it. And then after these formal presentations, we will open it up to your questions and we hope you brought some really good ones. All right, are we ready? <laughs> we can get started. So historians are kind of like detectives. We rarely have the whole story in front of us and instead we have to dig around gathering bits of information from a variety of places. Some of it is sitting in an archives reading old documents, but documents don't tell the whole story. Sometimes there is a photograph to go with the documents. Sometimes we have an artifact. Sometimes we have to combine specific things we know about one person with broader information we know about what, what life was like at that time. So we're putting together a puzzle using pieces that we find along the way, and we don't get the advantage of looking at the cover of the box. Sometimes we do realize later that we weren't right the first time, but that's okay. We're constantly learning more. Tonight, we're exploring written information, photographs, plus modern reproductions to understand what life was like for a person 138 years ago. To, so to speak to that, <clears throat> this dress belonged to Henrietta Gary, who went by Nettie. I haven't found a photo of her or much about her life, but I will share what I know and what I've been thinking about. So she was born in Searsport, Maine, to Mary and Marlboro Packard. They lived in this house on East Main Street in Searsport, and it is now the part of the Yard Arm Motel. According to the note that was given to the Penobscot Marine Museum, along with this dress, the dress was made in August of 1884. On August 27, 1884, Henrietta Packard married Franklin Gary. Soon after their wedding, they headed to Boston. I'm not sure how they got to Boston, but they may have taken the train or a steamboat, such as the steamer SS Penobscot, which is shown here. Um, uh, and it was making twice daily stops at Searsport at that time. The Penobscot was cutting edge and would have been pretty comfortable. She was the first of the Boston Bangor liners to have electric lights. When Henrietta and Franklin arrived in Boston, they boarded this ship, the SF Hersey. Nettie's father was a master ship builder and had led the construction of the Hersey in Searsport nearly 20 years before Nettie stepped on board. Henrietta's husband, Franklin, was the new captain, and they would be heading out on a working honeymoon voyage from Boston to Melbourne, then Newcastle, then Hong Kong, then Manila, and then finally home by way of New York City. So imagine, you're almost 23, you're newly married and headed out to sea with your new husband on what is likely to be a three month voyage, possibly longer. And three months just to start from here to Australia, That's it's gonna be, over a year before you get back to Searsport. So what was it like for Nettie on board the SF Hersey? Since she grew up in a shipbuilding and sailing community, it seems likely she had been on a merchant sailing vessel before. The captain's quarters were at the back of the vessel. And you can see over here kind of that raised roof of the cabin there. The cabin of a merchant vessel typically included uh, two large rooms in the middle flanked by smaller bedrooms on the sides. One of the large rooms served as the dining room for the officers, captain's family, and passengers, and had a large table with two benches. The other room would have been used as a sitting room or day cabin reserved for the captain and his family. 
this photo, like I mentioned, I don't have any photos of Nettie, but this one is of Ruth Montgomery, a Maine sea captain's daughter, and it was taken about 15 years after Nettie's voyage to Australia. If you didn't know otherwise, wouldn't you think she's sitting in her parlor at home on land? But this is actually the cabin of her father's ship. The two doors that we see in the back of the photo, those head out to the dining room. The mates and stewards rooms would have been attached to that room. And then the captain's bedroom, office, and bathroom are off of this room, as well as an additional stateroom or two. We can see the captain's office. You can see the desk and resources back there behind Ruth in this photo. The rooms were fashionably decorated. We can see the wall-to-wall -wall carpet, plus additional rugs, nice furniture, like the chair she's sitting in, chair over here, little table over here. Um, and plus there's photographs on the mantle. So it might've been a little smaller than at home, but it was definitely comfortable and nice. And so this is the space where Nettie would have lived, well, in a space like this on her honeymoon voyage. In addition to her husband, Franklin, the crew of the SF Hersey would have included a chief mate, a second mate, steward, cook, and 15 to 20 seamen. The steward was the captain's servant and kept the captain's cabin clean. Nettie may have taken meals and talked with the mates, but likely her interactions with the rest of the crew were minimal or non-existent. While they spent three months together in a relatively small confined space, there was a strict code of conduct expected. Nettie would have been limited how far on deck she was allowed to go. This photo is also one of Ruth Montgomery's, giving just a feel for what life at sea might be like. So what did Nettie do during the many days the SF Hersey was in the middle of the ocean? We don't have specific records from her, but we know that many captains, wives, and daughters spent their time reading, sewing, doing other handcrafts, writing in diaries, and writing long letters home. I imagine after three months at sea, Nettie was excited to reach the port of Melbourne, Australia. They arrived in December when the average temperature there is in the 70s. By the end of December, Nettie was also six months pregnant. While the ship was being unloaded and a new cargo located and loaded, Nettie would have enjoyed leisure time on board and on land. It was common to visit with other captains and their families, especially from other American or British vessels. And Nettie presumably also did some sightseeing. In the note that was given to the Penobscot Marine Museum along with the dress, Nettie wrote, I wore it in Australia on Christmas and on Boxing Day to the races, which is a big day in Australia. So after three months at sea, Nettie is out and about in Melbourne, Australia, enjoying seasonal festivities in this lovely getup. But as we look at the dress and think about what little we know about Nettie and her life, you have to wonder, what is it like to wear an outfit like this? What's going on under the dress to make it shaped like that? And could she even breathe? We can't talk to Nettie. Um, but how better to find out than by experience? So to answer these questions and to better understand Nettie through the clothing that she wore, we are now, now joined by Annalise, who was wearing a similar outfit and eager to talk about it. Hello, everyone. First, thank you so much to the Penobscot Marine Museum and to you, Gina, for hosting. Um, I'm really excited to talk about 1880s fashions with everybody tonight and can answer some of those questions to what's going on underneath the dress. And to do so, I am going to share a brief slide presentation so you can see each of the layers in detail. So let me go ahead and share my screen for everybody. All right, 1880s fashion. So 1880s is kind of the late bustle era. So this is 1883 through 1889. And in this time, the bigger the bustle, the better. The fashionable silhouette is flat in the front. Um, it has a very small waist and this large shelf-like protrusion at the back that's full of elaborate draperies. The designs of the 1880s emphasize elegance, structure, and tailoring. And so you'll see a lot of false vest fronts and jacket-like bodices, which are kind of a, uh, took their inspiration from menswear. 
There are lots of layers that create this fashionable silhouette. I've listed some of the layers here and we'll look at them in detail, starting with stockings and footwear, combinations, which are the layers closest to the skin, a corset, which is the foundational garment, fries shaping, and the bustle, of course, which again supports that kind of large protrusion at the back. Petticoats to soften the, to soften the look, uh, the dress, and then accessories. We have stockings and boots being the first layer. Stockings go to above the knees. They're made from silk, cotton, or sometimes wool for warmth. I love that they had striped stockings in the 1880s, and I put an example from the Met. Uh, I did get a question the other day on how stockings were held up. They usually wore garters, which are elasticized bands that would kind of keep the socks from slipping down. Footwear at this time has a medium height heel, usually features pointed toes and closes at the side with side lacing or buttons. I love the scallop details from this example from the Met. Combinations are the layer that's worn closest to the skin. These are kind of a combined camsole with uh, drawers or kind of pant legs. They usually buttoned in the front so you could get into them, but also so you could use the necessary. The next layer is the corset. And this is the main foundational piece. Corsets at this time period are long in length and they support the bust and provide control underneath form-fitting dresses. The ideal shape in this time period is kind of a full bust, a very narrow waist, and a round full hip. You see that there's a center bust closure. Busts have um, their metal and they have posts and loops that connect together at the front, allowing a woman to dress herself. They're usually stiffened with whalebone, steel, flat steels, or cotton cording is also seen. They're usually decorated with flossing. So these little red X's down here is the flossing or embroidery that keeps those bones in place. And the next layer of which the time period takes its name is the bustle. This is the support garment that creates that shelf-like look. There are many styles and they're made of many different materials from metal boning or reed or cane. I've seen cork. I've also seen all kinds of other kind of cloth stuffed forms. This particular style is called a lobster tail because it looks a lot like lobster. Uh, <laughs> I have an original from the vet uh, down here and the reproduction that I'm wearing on the far right. The bustle reaches its grandest size in 1886. Petticoats are worn to soften the lines of the bustle and to support the outer skirts. A lot of them were trimmed with layers of ruffles as these beautiful antique examples here. They could be plain or trimmed with tucks and lace. Again, these soften the lines of that hard kind of bustle shape and then kind of help the skirts stand out from the legs so you don't trip as you're walking. And dresses. The two-piece or even three-piece dress or ensemble is really popular in the 1880s. It usually consists of a long basque bodice and a skirt. And sometimes it will have a separate kind of drapery or overskirt. It's made of a lot of different materials. You see wool, silk, satin, brocades. Velvet is very popular, as is lace. When I say a basque bodice, what I'm referring to is an extension beyond the waist. This is a great example here of that basque. Basques could, um, or I should say, basque bodices of the time period tend to be very long and they can end in kind of points like this front here, or in pleats like the back here. Bodices tend to be very form-fitting. So it's in the front fitted with darts and in the back fitted with um, curved seams called princess seams in the time period. And it just contours to the shape of the body that is supported by that corset. Bodices at this time kind of uh, will sometimes have either false vest fronts or trim that will make it look like there's a vest. Again, it's that tailoring influence. You'll also see high collars, as well as fitted sleeves, sometimes with cuffs, to mimic a jacket. Paired with the bodice is a skirt, and the skirts can either match or contrast with the bodice fabrics. You have an overskirt or draperies, which either are attached 
on one waistband or separate kind of skirts that go over top. And they're often asymmetrical. They, they feature a lot of pleats and poofs and swags, and they sit over top that bustle. Usually the draperies fall between the waist and the back of the knees. Then you have the underskirt, which could be plain, like the examples we have here on the slides, or they could also be trimmed with pleats, flounces, lace is also popular. The skirts end at the floor for the day, but can have a longer train for the evening. And our finishing touches. Our hair is swept high on top of the head into a bun or curls, and fringed bangs or kind of curls is very popular. There's all sorts of hats or little BB bonnets, but the signature hat of the 1880s is that flower pot style, which has a really tall crown and a small brim. These brims are straight. The one that I'm wearing has a curved brim. You'll see them decorated with lots of flowers, ribbons, and all kinds of feathers, and sometimes even full birds. We think of that of the 1880s or that late Victorian period all the way to the 19 teens as the era of wearing feathers and even full birds on top of your head, so much to the point that a lot of species uh, were endangered or went extinct. And then gloves and parasols are also a must for outdoor strolls. Now that you know what's underneath and on top of the dress and the accessories, I'm going to open it up for questions. I'll show you my dress. I'll switch to my other camera. Um, and you are welcome to ask all your questions. So let me go ahead and uh, switch to my other camera so you can see full length. So this is the bustle dress. As you see, I do have that false vest as well as the jacket style here. I also have the full bustle, again, supported by that structure that you saw, the lobster bustle. I have my flower pot hat as well as some jet accessories. How heavy is the bustle and its petticoats? Good question. So the bustle itself is very light. It's made of, um, well, it has flat steels in them. Let me show you an example of flat steels. Steel is uh, very lightweight and flexible. So my bustle has a um, little stronger than this uh, steels that kind of create that shape. So it's very light and collapsible. I like to think of bustles as kind of like slinkies because they kind of collapse up in themselves when, they, when you go to sit. Um, so that's very light. I am wearing two petticoats, which one does have a deep flounce on it. So it's not very heavy, but um, it is definitely sturdy. Women could starch their petticoats to kind of stiffen them, as well as uh, the skirt. The skirt is probably the heaviest piece because the ensemble is made of wool. And does it affect your balance or your center of gravity at all while wearing it? Ooh, good question. I always feel when I'm wearing historical clothing that my posture is much improved. It could be the corset, which uh, I am fully corseted, um, but just putting on all of the garments and the layers just makes you want to stand up straighter. Okay, the next question, somebody picked up perhaps on how Henrietta was probably six months pregnant when she was wearing this in December, which was early, but how would the structure of the dress have been altered as pregnancy advanced? Ooh, that's a great question. So there are examples of maternity corsets which have laces that can kind of help um, accommodate uh, as you grow, but there are different styles of dresses. So perhaps Henrietta or Nettie uh, would have been wearing what's known as a wrapper. Wrappers um, may have some of the fashionable elements, but they usually close with drawstrings. So drawstrings would allow for that expansion in front. It's fascinating. <laughs> it is. There's all different types of styles. I'm showing you an example. And um, Nettie's dress is an example of a, a fashionable outfit for just day wear um, or, you know, as she's on her ship. Uh, but there are all kinds of different examples of clothing from, you know, your kind of work clothing, uh, which are nice, simple cotton ensembles to wrappers to evening gowns. 
Okay, this is a great comment. Um, but so the question is, what was the original inspiration for the bustle? But I can't imagine a woman woke up one morning and thought I'm going to wear this big thing behind me and all her friends thought it was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, sometimes that's how fashion goes, right? <laughs> well, the bustle itself came, um, was kind of an evolution. I think that fashion always grows on itself. So in the 18, the mid kind of uh, 19th century, the 1860s, we think of those big cage crinolines or hoop skirts. Throughout the mid-century, you know, as skirts get wider and wider, suddenly they start to become more elliptical. So a lot of the fullness goes to the back, so much so that by 1870, all the fullness is in the back. And the 1880s is kind of a revival of what you see in the 1870s or that first bustle period uh, with just all that fullness pushed to the back. The 1880s has a much flatter front and again, kind of emphasizes more tailoring. So you don't see as, as many kind of flounces as you do a little earlier with the bustle, but that's where it comes from. It's a natural progression of fashion. So how long does it take to get dressed? Good question. Uh, so it was made, or it was mentioned earlier that I am a historical interpreter, so I get to wear costumes like this uh, as I talk to the public at my living history site. Uh, because I have done that for quite a few years now, uh, I, I would say it, it, it um, varies on the style of dress you're getting dressed in, but this particular dress probably takes me about 45 minutes to put on. A lot of the time is spent on the hair, um, and then the rest is getting dressed in all those layers. I will also say that if you're late to work, it takes you a whole lot less time to put it all on. <laughs> How do the petticoats fit at the waist to keep the slim look? Uh, well, I am corseted. So first the corset kind of, you know, really does define that waist. And the waistbands are put on, um, or I should say the petticoats are put on separate waistbands that have button closures and you just kind of gradually stack them. So my bustle is worn, like the waistband of the bustle is worn right at the waist and the the second and third petticoats, or I should say the first and second petticoats, um, have slightly larger waistbands. So they kind of Jack to keep that slim profile. Wow. And the, the, the question we've all been wondering, how does one sit in an average chair with a bustle? <laughs> I was hoping someone would ask that question. It's a lot of fun to talk about. If you think back to the slideshow, you saw how it was kind of graduated bones. Think of one of those slinkies. They really just collapse on top of themselves. I'm going to go ahead and pull over my chair and give you a, a <laughs> let you know how that works. But um, so here's the chair, and I'm going to do it from a side profile so you can see what I mean when I say that it kind of um, just collapses on itself like a slinky. So I'm just going to kind of back up and sit down. It just collapses on itself. I'll do it from the side as well. That doesn't look so bad. Not at all. It's very comfortable. Of course it is, too. <laughs> You, you claim a corset is comfortable. Well, how tight is your corset? So corsets uh, allow me to do my work at work uh, when I'm interpreting. Um, corsets really are the brassiere of the time period, so you need that for the support. But also I think it's like a gentle hug around the body. You don't wanna be pulling those laces so tight that you can't breathe. Uh, you can do everything in a corset. I mean, I can touch my toes in my corset. <laughs> um, so the corset is just to really take the, to give you that shape, but also to take the weight of the skirts off of your waist. I do have an example of a, another reproduction corset. This is based on an 1880s pattern. It's not as long as the corset I'm wearing right now, but this is, shows you that um, loop and stud busk that uh, allows a woman to dress herself, but it gives you an idea of what that corset looks like. It, it's fully boned, so it's somewhat flexible, but um, it does provide structure for the rest of the dress to sit on top of. And actually we find at our site, we do a lot of uh, manual work from cooking in the kitchen to uh, farm labor. 
I find that interpreters really prefer wearing the corset because after a long day, you know, it really helps with the back support, helps you bend at the knees instead of at the waist to prevent any kind of injury. Women were smart. Fashion was sometimes practical and sometimes impractical, but just fashionable. So you've been talking about how you wear um, a corset as an interpreter today, but how do you know that they weren't trying to like suck it all in a hundred years ago? Well, there are vain people in every time period. <laughs> so tight lacing, as it's called, you know, is a bit more of a reduction. You may see that for someone who wants to look their slimmest uh, for the ball and all, but uh, on the day to day, because women are wearing this really from the time they you know put on their course in the morning to the evening when they're taking it off, it has to be comfortable or they would have ditched it a long time ago. But tight lacing, <laughs> we see it a lot more in the media, but it could have been done by, again, the society's most fashionable. So speaking of fashionable versus, un well, not unfashionable, but so the question is, would women in Maine wear bustles for everyday wear or would people, again, at your site, which is not in a major city, would they have been wearing um, bustles just casually? In the 19th century, anyone can know the latest fashions usually coming from Britain and France, and then Americans join in the fray through fashion plates, as well as other popular magazines, newspaper descriptions. So most people would have had access to know what the latest fashions were. Whether they were wearing this for every day, you know, to the, the width of what is most fashionable, Perhaps not, but even ladies who are wearing work dresses could have taken elements of the most fashionable and, you know, made sure that their skirts were fuller in the back and flatter in the front, whether or not they were wearing, you know, the full lobster bustle or a small pad. You'll see kind of traveling bustles or, um, or what is labeled as traveling bustles today or kind of cotton stuffed forms. Um, and those would have been a lot more practical, <laughs> smaller to walk around in and do your daily chores. Hmm. Let's switch gears a little bit. Um, did they wear makeup in the 1880s? So the wearing of makeup um, is still kind of frowned upon. You could wear things like, um, you know, so, some scents, uh, perhaps a little rice powder to help with your complexion, but kind of outward cosmetics is, is still frowned upon. Hmm. Okay, that looks like it would be really hot if you were wearing that, even if it's in the only in the 70s in Melbourne at Christmas. So the garments are somewhat um, warmer than say wearing a t-shirt and shorts, of course, but uh, at our site, we do wear costumes all year round in all temperatures and it is warmer, but it's not unbearable. And as far as the content, during the summer, you could wear something like a lighter cotton that may be sheer or something like linen, which is very wicking. Um, they even wore lightweight wools, tropical wools um, in the summer because of the wicking properties. So it kind of takes the moisture of you know, your sweat and just kind of pulls it away from your body. So it's, it's warmer, but it's not unbearable. Cool. Can you talk about the process of creating reproductions? Do you make any of the items or do you purchase them? This one is a borrowed one. So this one is one of the ones that we have at our site. So I did not make this dress. Um, I'm just getting to dress up in this particular outer dress. However, I made every element of my undergarments. Uh, well, I purchased the, the stockings, but from the garters to the the, you saw my lobster tail bustle uh, to the petticoats to uh, the combinations. All of that was made by me. Most of my garments I do make. Um, and where that process begins is it really begins by looking at originals. So for me, I want to know what they were wearing, how they made those shapes. And I would look at museum examples. I'd read descriptions of them. Uh, Things like Godey's Magazine is very, um, it's a great source for seeing, you know, those fashions. Um, and so once you do a lot of research, I also like to look at originals. Uh, we have a Susan Green collection at work, which is really nice because you can go and just 
see the originals. <laughs> Very spoiled in that, that regard. Um, but so I research first, and then I'll start patterning. Um, I drape and pattern a lot of my um, a lot of my garments, you can buy ready-made patterns that are great historical um, ready-made patterns that are based off of original garments if you're looking for something accurate. And of course, there are you know, other kind of influenced by patterns that you can begin with those shapes and adapt by looking at those originals um, to something that's as accurate as you can be to what they would have worn. Um, so after you um, research, then you <laughs> pattern, you can just set about uh, stitching them. One of the rules at my site, and one that I follow my own practice, is uh, we don't use a sewing machine when it, it's when they wouldn't have had it. So um, by the 1880s, we have sewing machines. So this one is sewn by machine with any of the details hand stitched because sometimes you can't get as you know as fussy with the machine as you can with hands. Kind of when you fold and manipulate pleats and all. When you say use a machine, are you using a treadle or a modern one? I wish I could say I was using a treadle machine <laughs> to do it all the way, but I am using a modern industrial. Okay. Do, um, did they wear a lot of jewelry in the 1880s? Jewelry was a popular um, accessory. I'm wearing jet reproduction uh, earrings here, as well as a, a brooch. Um, you could also see bracelets, those were pretty popular, and there was a lot of hair jewelry um, made either out of friendship as a remembrance of somebody. Uh, you also see a lot of watch fobs made out of the hair jewelry. There were necklaces for evening, so just about anything you can think of that we have today they would have had by the 1880s. Um, and then I guess I have two questions here. How often as, a, as an interpreter do you wash your clothes, your costume? Good question. So first I should say that we are not washing, we are following kind of what the Victorians did. We are not washing all of those many layers because it would take a lot of time and puts a lot of strain on the garments. What you're washing is the combinations or the layers that are touching your skin and your stockings. Uh, you're washing those every single time that you wear them uh, because there's they're really what's uh, absorbing body oils or you know any kind of sweat. So you definitely wanna wash those every single time you wear them, uh, just like we do today with our clothes. But um, petticoats and uh, dresses, those are usually spot cleaned. Um, something like this ensemble, because it's wool, we would send to a dry cleaner today, um, probably you know, when, it, when it really needs it. But other than that, if you get dirt on it, you can kind of just brush the dirt off once it dries. And again, spot cleaning any small like stains that get on your dress. And so in the 1880s, how were they washing? So <laughs> I don't know completely the ins and outs of washing technology in the 1880s, but I'm guessing that they're doing something very similar to what we are doing, um, where they are washing the layers that are closest to the body uh, using soap um, and scrubbing them. There were some kind of washing machines that uh, are made with metal um, and also ringers to dry them, so kind of an idea of a, like a drying machine. Uh, also, they would have used gluing, which is little kind of almost dyeing over your whites to keep them white. That's why laundry detergent today is blue. It has a little bit of dye in it that keeps your whites looking white. <laughs> How many dresses would an average small town woman own? That's a good question. It does, it does change uh, depending on your social status, but you said everyday woman. Um, she's definitely going to have a best dress, something that might look like this that she could wear to church or wear to other social functions. Uh, she would have maybe, you know, several other dresses um, in various states of newness, something that's a little older, it could be worn for you know, chores and around the house. She might own a wrapper, which is a kind of an informal uh, gown, similar to what we were talking about for maternity, that's um, a lot more comfortable and doesn't require you know, wearing a corset or wearing all the rest of the layers. It's something that would be worn in the privacy of the home, <laughs> but that's, that's what she might own. 
Yeah, that, that makes sense too, because in Nettie's note to the, well, that the museum has, she mentions how she specifically wore this outfit for these special festivals. So she probably wasn't wearing it on a regular day. Uh, how often were dresses refinished to keep up with fashion? Yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. So the, all of the uh, value is really in the fabric itself. So you'll see lots of dresses that are um, refashioned, retrimmed uh, to keep up with those latest fashions. So you'll see dresses that there's a lot of fabric in skirts. So you'll see skirts taken apart to be remade into dresses. Um, fashion, if you're really, really fashionable changes like every five years in the, in the 19th century. So it is difficult to, if, to keep up with every single change. You have to have um, the social status to really keep up with every nuance of fashion. But women at all uh, classes will be kind of redoing garments to retrimming them to get to hint at those fashionable elements. These are some great questions that are coming in. So just a reminder, if you do have any questions, like any questions at all, you can just pop them into the chat box and we will discuss them. This is fascinating. Um, what was the balance of homemade dresses versus seamstress made versus factory store bought? Again, specifically thinking of smaller towns, not the big cities. So by the late um, Victorian period, you do see some ready-made items, uh, whether you could purchase full ready-made dresses, uh, that really depends on where you are. Major cities will have that ability, perhaps, you know, out where we're representing in, in New York, maybe not so much. You could get some ready-made patterns. Uh, you could certainly buy all your cloth. Um, ready-mades would like undergarments that don't require as much fitting, you could probably get e more easily. Um, but as far as the full out dresses, you'd still be relying on dressmakers uh, who are skilled in the art of cutting and shaping cloth to the body. Um, I think that's, that's the information I could give you off the top of my head. Your hat doesn't look very practical. Uh, so it is more fashionable than practical. It's, it's that signature flower pot shape. Um, but you're right. The brim is cute because it's upturned, but it's not going to provide me a lot of sunshade. So instead, I would uh, use parasol. Um, this is actually a folding marquee parasol from the uh, mid uh, 19th century, but it works to show you the, the general idea. But uh, with a parasol, by the 1880s, they're actually a lot larger and fancy, kind of to reflect how large and fancy the dresses have gotten. But the idea is that the parasol would provide the sun shade. You can kind of move it as you uh, need to, to protect your complexion. <laughs> you should see some of the bonnets from the era. They get very tiny and they sit in the back of your head and provide absolutely no sun protection. Veils are also um, an option. You hang a veil, kind of acts as both uh, sunscreen, because it literally does. It's like a screen uh, <laughs> keeping the sun off your face, but also acts like sunglasses. Um, you see veils black being very popular because it's, it's great. Um, but also green is sometimes used. You'll see other dark colors. Think of any of the colors that we see in sunglasses today. They really can help keep the sun uh, from getting in your eyes. Fascinating. Um, while we're on the topic of accessories, what about gloves? Gloves, yes, you'll definitely um, see gloves. You'll see kind of, I actually have a pair over here. Uh, you'll see the wrist length gloves um, made out of kid leather, um, but you'll also see kind of longer gloves for evening. Mm. Definitely important to keep the uh, sun off your delicate, uh, <laughs> Uh, skin on the backs of your hands. Were there any preferred colors or patterns for clothes in the 1880s or was it up to an individual's taste? There is um, a lot of individual taste, like clothing is one of the ways that you show your identity, but typically you'll see lighter colors in the summer. Um, we talked about, again, trying to keep cool, so lighter colors, pastels, um, little prints, kind of gauzy fabrics. During the winter, you'll see darker colors, a lot of jewel tones, very popular. Um, they loved um, 
chemical dyes. So you can get really vibrant kind of, again, those jewel tones uh, that you'll see for winter time. But again, it's really personal preferences to the color of your dresses. As for prints, you do see a lot of small kind of uh, print, printed cottons or calicos for gay dresses, for kind of your more around the house or chores kind of clothing. Um, bigger prints and plaids are also popular. What would you be wearing in the winter to stay warmer? Good question. So there's a lot of different ways that you can uh, stay warm. One of them is by your uh, undergarments. You could wear something like a flannel combination um, or a flannel petticoat that will keep you nice and warm. Um, it's like a, wearing a quilt on your legs all day. Uh, but you could also switch out for some wool stockings. You could layer up with, um, uh, they have all kinds of different jackets or wraps. One that comes to mind is the Talma wrap. It looks like a little cape, um, usually with these long kind of lapels that come down the front. They're very fancy. <laughs> but you also had capes. You did have jackets, coats. These would all be made out of wool or velvet or something kind of sturdy and often lavishly decorated. And would they have to be like, would they have to take into account the bustle? They do have to take into account the bustle because it is quite a shelf. Uh, the coats have to be cut, um, fitted to the back of the waist, and then they have to have pleats to make it over that bustle. Mm. And you see a lot of deep pleats to make it over the bustle. So again, much like the dresses, most of the emphasis and the fabric falls to the back. These are great questions. <laughs> I like the ones that make me really think. It's a fun conversation. Mm, the questions are slowing from the audience, um, but I'll throw one out there that's a little bit less related. And you don't actually interpret the 1880s on a regular basis, but you've interpreted many different time periods. So what's your favorite time period to interpret fashion wise? Ooh. That's a hard question. I always like to say anything that's 1750 to 1950, but uh, at my site, we focus on 1790 all the way to about 1870. So um, in that kind of time frame, I really enjoy when I'm working, wearing Regency era clothing, which is the 1800s to about 1820s when it's a very slim kind of columnar shape with a very high bust. Um, it's great because I like it. It's easy to throw on and wear, <laughs> very comfortable. But uh, as far as other favorites, I really like the mid-century. So the 1850s and the 1860s when skirts are really at their widest all the way around. I love it because it's like a big canvas. You can put as much trim and all kinds of stuff on that, that big skirt that you'd like. Also, the accessories are great. I think the accessories are great in every time period. There's so many different hats and bonnets and uh, parasols, of course. When you have made clothing, what's your preferred era? Ooh, <laughs> for making clothing, I think I've made the most clothing uh, just for the eras that I interpret. Um, <laughs> but uh, my largest wardrobe is probably that mid-century. I think I've gotten it down to kind of a, a science, if you will. I have a bodice block that I've drafted that I can use that block to kind of make all the different um, details that I want so I don't have to start from scratch every single time. Uh, so 1860s, the, the, the difficulty of the bodice and the different sleeve styles really appeals to me and the skirt's just a big rectangle. Which is one of the reasons why I really like the bustle period and I'm uh, definitely going to make some bustle dresses this season uh, as I oversee some of the 1870s buildings. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they offer all kinds of unique challenges because fitting is really the important um, design element for the 1870s and 1880s. So what about pockets? Like, where do you put your stuff? Good question. For the 1880s, um, you sometimes would have like a little watch pocket at the front. This dress does not have any pockets, <laughs> but you could have side pockets. Um, that are just made one with the side of the skirt. Under those bustle draperies, it's a little hard to access the pockets. So usually you would carry around uh, something on the outside, like a purse or reticule. Um, they would also have shadow leaves, which kind of attached at the side and have things like your scissors and thimble and maybe like a pin case on them, uh, just for easy access to items. 
Can we talk about your hair a little bit? Sure. So uh, hair is a lot of fun. Um, uh, in the French, you've got the fringed curls that are um, sometimes called Josephine curls uh, in the period. I've seen them referred to that. I have, um, again, swept all my hair up to the top. It is put in braids and uh, just kind of loop up. And then I'll tell you a secret. The 1880s loved hair extensions. Uh, so I have this large kind of coronet uh, braid that is not mine. <laughs> Having all that hair offers like a perch with a hat. Mm. My hair is long. It does. I am able to uh, kind of sit on it. So it's long, but like the ladies of the time period, you know, the volume needed for the hairstyles, uh, you often use extensions. And what are you using to hold it all in place or what would they have used? Oh, good question. Um, hair pins. I use U pins. Um, mine are steel U pins and that's similar to what they would have used. How would women get their hair to curl so tightly? Did they have curling irons? You know, they did have curling irons. Uh, rag curls were a technique popular earlier. Um, I'm not sure how often they would be curling their hair. There was a lot of false curls. What do you mean by false curls? Like I said, hair extensions are all the rage. There's the whole catalogs that you can see of offering, you know, the, the finest uh, hair extensions from whole, uh, whole buns to front curls. There are great examples of museum collections of those false curls as well. Also depends a lot on your natural hair texture. My hair is very long and very straight and very coarse and it would not keep little curls. This is fun. All the questions that we've ever wanted to know. <laughs> All the secrets revealed. <laughs> well, our time, we have, we have about five to 10 more minutes if we do have any more questions, but they seem to be slowing. But if you do have questions, go ahead and pop them into the chat box. I'm also gonna throw into the chat box um, all of Annalise's um, social media, because again, if you're not following her, you should be. Uh, let's see, here we go. Um, and I also wanna make, make a pitch. If you're interested in our dress that Henrietta Gary wore, we're gonna be doing a workshop coming up in the next few weeks, um, kind of exploring, we're gonna take a very close look at her dress and kind of explore how she made it and make kind of a bracelet inspired by the work that she did. Um, so you can visit us on Facebook or our website to find out more about that. Looks like we're wrapping up. So thank you, Annalise, for joining us. And thank all of you in the audience for joining us as well. And have a great night. Thank you so much, everybody.